which I can't wait for anything else. Amen. So if you'll turn with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 18. Genesis, chapter 18. And we'll read one verse of Scripture, verse number 14. Uh, well, I'll tell you. And verse number 14, and this is what the Scripture says. Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. I want to speak to you out of this portion of Scripture, and I know that most of you are familiar with the story of how uh, Abraham is sitting in the front of the tent one day, and he's visited uh, from heaven, and there's a promise made to him. Uh, and this promise is that he's going to receive a son. And uh, as he's in the in front of the tent, and as God speaks to him and promises him that son, Sarah in the back of the tent laughs. Uh, you know, uh, you say, well, preacher, that wasn't so good. But I tell you what she's talking about, and when the Lord's talking about them having a baby, and Abraham's 100 and she's 90, uh, that's something to laugh about, amen, in a sense. Uh, but the Lord comes up to her, and the Lord speaks to her, and the Lord asks this question. Uh, he said, why did you laugh? Uh, and she said, I didn't laugh. He said, it wasn't me. Uh, of course, there wasn't anybody in the tent but Sarah, and God knows the heart, amen. And she denied at first that she laughed. Uh, I can't really blame her for that. But here it is that the Lord God of heaven himself asked this question. Is there anything too hard for God? Well, I tell you, that ought to challenge our heart tonight now. God wants to put some things before us. God wants us to see, as the old prophet Jeremiah did, there is nothing too hard for God. He said, Lord, by your outstretched hand you made the world and all that's in it. And he looked toward heaven and he cried aloud and he said, there is nothing too hard for thee. And I want to try to preach to you tonight just from that one little question of Genesis 18, 14. In Genesis chapter 18, there are seven great questions. Uh, you ought to go home tonight and dig them out and read them. But I'm going to try to stay on one. You know, my wife always gets weird, not so much in this chapter, but I preach every once in a while over in Exodus chapter 15 on the 12 wells over there at Edom or Moriah and the 12 bitter wells. Uh, and every time I do, I see her begin to shake and get nervous. Uh, and you know why she does that? She said she's not worried about those 12 wells, but if I ever get on those 70 palm trees, uh, we'll be there for a long time. Amen? Uh, and so tonight, I'm going to try to stay just, uh, uh, just on one question. I'll try to do that. Is there anything too hard for God? And the first thing I want you to know is this, and I hope you'll grip this this week. Uh, I hope you'll put it down in the gable iron of your soul and dare to believe what I'm going to tell you. There's no place too hard for for God to send revival. Amen? There's no place too hard for God to send revival. Now, as I was talking to one of the men, and in the last three years, I believe one year I preached 42 meetings. Uh, one year I preached 35 meetings. Uh, one year 39 meetings. Uh, and I've been in revival uh, ri literally up and down this land, uh, all through the south. Uh, and, but you know that most places that I go, uh, before I even get in good, uh, the pastor will meet me or the pastor will talk to me or a week before I come, I'll get a letter or a phone call and he'll tell me how hard this particular area is or that particular area and he'll give me 50, 11 reasons why we can't have revival. I, well, I can give him one. He's not expecting it. Amen? Now, uh, that's the best reason I know. But I want you to know something. I am convinced. Uh, I'm persuaded uh, that there's no place that God cannot uh, send revival. Uh, I believe we still live in a day of revival. And I believe it's liable to break out this week. Uh, I'm looking for the spirit of revival to fall here in this church uh, and spread throughout this community. You say, preacher, you really believe that we can have revival? Well, what does the Bible say? In Second Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14, it said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, turn from their wicked ways and seek my face, uh, then, then, then. The problem is we haven't come to then. Amen? Uh, uh, before you get to then, you've got to do some things. Uh, there's got to be some humility. There's got to be some brokenheartedness. There's got to be con some confession. And there's got to be for some forsaking. And when that takes place, uh, God is honor bound. He said, if you do those four things, 
then will I heal from heaven. He said, then will I forgive your sins. Then will I heal your land. Brother, if I didn't believe that, I wouldn't believe John 3, 16. Amen. I believe that we still live in a day and an hour and a time, and God wants to pour out the spirit of revival on his people. I believe there's no place too hard for God to send revival. You say, preacher, did you ever see revival in a hard place? Do you know where there's been a real hard place that's been broken with revival? Well, I can give you an example or two. Amen. First of all, I'm reminded of a place called Mount Carmel. Amen. Over in 1 Kings chapter 17. And you say, did revival fall? Sure did. Old Elijah the prophet went up on top of that mountain, prayed 63 words, got out of the way and let the fire of God fall, and they had a revival. Amen. You say, preacher, was that a hard place? Well, let me give you four or five reasons or things about that. One of the things that would make that a hard place and one of the reasons people wouldn't expect revival was uh, that old Elijah was out there one day and God came to him and said, I got a message for you. I want you to take it down there and deliver it uh, to O Ahab the king. Uh, can you imagine that fella? I'm going to bet you he just got all puffed up with pride. Uh, can you imagine that? Uh, and he said, look at this. God's chosen me to take a message down to the king. Uh, and he said, Lord, what do you want me to tell him? Uh, uh, what, what kind of a blessing are you going to pour out on Israel? What are you going to do for this nation? Uh, uh, what mighty wonder or deed and uh, 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 what do you want me to prophesy? More about that time his bubble burst. You know what he said? Uh, he said, you go down there and tell Ahab uh, he's the worst king Israel ever had. Uh, boy, uh, now how'd you like to take that message, amen? Uh, uh, listen to me. You know what? I like I like to preach in the glory, don't you? I like to preach in the glory comes down. I hope it gets the foggy in here with me to see an eye dog uh, to find a way out tonight. I, I mean that. I, I want it to fall. Uh, but you know, sometimes, uh, instead of the glory, God says preach one of them tomcat messages. Amen. You know what a tomcat message is. It's one that leaves everybody scratched and bleeding a little bit. And that's the way God speaks sometimes. He said, scratch them up. Tear them apart. Well, I hope he lets us stay in the glory this week. Amen. But he told him, he said, go down there and tell him he's the worst king that Israel ever had. So that was one reason when the righteous are in authority, the nation's prospered. But when the wicked, uh, it's death and destruction and doom for the nation. And he said, tell him he's the worst king that Israel ever had. The second thing, it wouldn't have been so bad to go down and do that, but tell him he's married to the wickedest woman that ever lived. Amen? Now, now when you, listen, when you start talking to a fella and, and stand eyeball to eyeball and talk, uh, you know, it's one thing, but you go to him and start talking about his wife, you lie will to get in trouble. Amen? He'll get scared up. But he said, you go down there and tell that the mealy mouth little old thing that his wife has led Israel into a and tell him that it's here, her fault. Uh, tell her that it's she's the one that's erected uh, the places of worship to Baal and the prophets of the grove uh, and those 850 false prophets that she's brought in, uh, that old wicked, rebellious, uh, adulterous woman. Uh, but tell him that God has judged her sin and tell him uh, that she's going to lay dead in the streets uh, and the dogs are going to come and lick her bones uh, and lick her blood and eat her bones. Uh, boy, I tell you, that was a message of judgment. Amen. Uh, so he said the worst king and the wickedest woman. And then there's the third reason you wouldn't have expected revival there. It was because they had the weakest Christians. Amen. You know, it says uh, that 7,000 of them had never bowed their knee to Baal. But I want you to know something. Uh, that wasn't the problem. The problem is that that 7,000 of those birds uh, had never stood for God. Uh, that was the problem. Uh, they were hid out in the cave over there on bread and water. And it bootlegged out of that old wicked king king's uh, house. Amen. Uh, or over the eye would go in there and go into the kitchen of the king uh, and get the bread and the water and take it down and give it to him in a cave. Uh, and when it came down to it and the reason that they hadn't had revival was because the people hadn't taken their stand and stood for God. And when Elijah did preach a message after the fire fell, it was why I stand you halt between two opinions. If Baal's God, serve him. And if God's God, serve him. Brother, this is what we need in this day and age. It's not enough just not to bow. It's not enough just not to get into that crowd. But we need some people that are going to take a stand for God and not be ashamed to identify and let people know that they believe in the Lord God of heaven and stand and identify and, 
before the world that people will know they're different. So they had the wickedest Christians. But I'm glad that in the midst of that, the worst king, the wickedest woman, and the wickedest Christians, that God had a willing prophet. Amen? And that old prophet went down and declared the whole counsel of God. And when he did, God gave wonderful results. Now that's a good little old five-point outline. And somebody can preach it sometime. Amen? But there came revival to Mount Carmel. You say, preacher, that's just one. Well, let me give you another one. Amen? How about over in Nineveh? Did you ever think about that. In Jonah chapter 1, it says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah the son of Amittai and said, Arise, go to that city and cry out against it, for their sin has come up before me. Now, I know a lot of people that criticize old Jonah. Now, I want you to know he's one of my favorite characters in all the Bible. But the word of the Lord came to Jonah and said, Go to Nineveh. Now, everybody knows Nineveh means to the east. And instead, he went to Tarsus, and that means to the west. Now, you say, Preacher, he was out of the will of God. You criticize him if you want to. I've been out of the God's will too many times uh, to make fun of somebody else. Uh, I'll be honest with you, this is one of the hardest things that I have to do is determine the will of God for my life uh, and stay centered in God's will. Uh, now old Jonah missed the will of God uh, and he went away. But before you criticize him, think about this for a minute. Do you know that God sent him up there and he called one Jew to go up to Nineveh and that was a Felicitine city. Uh, and do you know that ever since there were Felicitines and, and Jews that they were sworn enemies. Here the Felicitines had sworn to the destruction of the Jews. We're going to wipe them out. They were mortal enemies. And there they had a stronghold, a wicked and a bloody city, a city that was made up of mighty warriors, 650,000 strong. And he told that one little old Jew to go up there and preach to them. That's quite a task, isn't it? You say, preacher, well, listen, if you think it's so easy, I don't see one man down here preaching in the middle of Harrison and change that city and turned it around. Amen. Here was a man that was going up and had to speak to 650,000 people and it was a message of destruction. Can you imagine that you go in among people who are your sworn enemies? One little individual man and stand up there in the middle of the street and say, listen, you all are supposed to be a great, a fierce, a warlike nation, but I want you to know the Lord God of heaven has looked down and judged your sin and the day's going to come when the judgment of God is going to fall and your city's going to be utterly destroyed. And in future generations, they'll look for the foundations of this city and won't even be able to prove it existed because even the foundations are going to be destroyed. Boy, that's a rough message, amen? It wouldn't have been so bad to go to a fierce and a warlike nation, but those people were stupid over there. You say they were? Well, the last chapter and the last verse of the book of Jonah says 120,000 of them didn't know their left hand from their right hand. Amen. Now, I don't mind preaching to mean people, but when they just uh, don't have common sense, uh, well, they wouldn't have had any better sense than to hurt a fellow, would they? But he went up there and he began to preach. And I want you to know something. Anytime that God calls a man, he enables a man. Amen. God never sent a man, and he didn't intend for him to get the job done. You know, when old John was out there on that boat uh, and finally prevailed upon him and uh, in spite of the fact that they didn't want to, they finally threw him overboard. Uh, and do you know what happened? Uh, that big old whale come along and glommed him up. Uh, now, I've seen a lot of people. Uh, I've ridden in a lot of things. Uh, you know, I've ridden in rickshaws and submarines. Uh, I ain't never rode no whale a cab, amen? Uh, but I'm telling you, uh, listen, mm, uh, there's more to that uh, than meets the eye. Do you know who the god of the Felicitines was? Uh, it was a god by the name of Dagon. And if you've ever seen a picture of old Dagon, and you remember when the ark of the Lord was captured by the Felicitines and put in the temple by Dagon, and how he fell over on his nose. But Dagon was half man and half fish. And they worshipped the fish god, old Dagon. And he had a head up there that was the head of a man, but the tail and the body of him was the body of a fish. And he said, those Ninevites, every single day, five times a day, they'd go to the temple and worship that old fish god and they'd bow down before that old fish and pray to him i mean let me tell you something if you'd done that all your life and then about four o'clock one morning just as the sun rises over that old sea a whale had come running up the river opened up his mouth and a little old fellow had come out of there seaweed hanging out behind his ear hollering i've got a message from god i believe you'd have paid attention hallelujah amen listen god sent a man with a message 
oxygen in and able to. And he got the attention of the people to listen to thus saith the word of God. And you know what happened? 650,000 people repented and got right with God. You know what happened? The king went down and told the stable keeper. He said, listen, this thing's on and I don't want anything to destroy it. He said, I'll tell you what you do. He said, you don't water the animals. You don't feed those cows and you don't feed those horses. Don't give them any water. Put them in sackcloth and ashes. And it's recorded that even the animals cried in repentance toward God. Well, I believe they had such a revival the cats and dogs didn't fight for a month. Amen. I'm telling you, that's a revival when even the animals in the stall get right with God. But that was a hard place, but God had a man. Amen. Now, there's a third one, and I'll try to hear you because some fellas told me we only had an hour and a half tape on tonight. Amen. But listen. The third place uh, was uh, Dry Bone Valley Baptist Church. Amen. Uh, you know where Dry Bone Valley Baptist Church is, don't you? It's over in Ezekiel chapter 37. Uh, boy, I tell you, some of these boys are going to be preacher boys. Uh, I hope you got that preacher's edge. Uh, there's nothing like it. Amen. Uh, I, boy, I believe old Ezekiel had it. Uh, he was, had a burning down the gable iron of his soul, and he wanted to preach. Uh, boy, I bet he was thrilled one day. The Lord said, hey, Zeke, uh, said, I got you a congregation. Uh, I want you to go and preach to him. He said, here I am, Lord. I, I'm ready. He said, go up to the top of that hill. And so he ran up there. And can you just see him as he came up to that cliff? And he looked over and he said, uh-oh. You know what the first question he asked was? He said, Lord, can these bones live? Why, if you ever get in evangelistic work, you'll wonder sometimes whether they can or not too. Amen. But you know what? He ran up there to the top of that fence. Now that cliff and he looked out there and he said, Lord, can these bones live? And the Lord said, prophesy or preach. He said, preacher, you said that's Dry Bone Valley Baptist Church. Let me give you three things about those bones. Why I believe they were Baptists. Amen. The first thing about those bones were they were dead. Hallelujah. Brothers, that don't describe most Baptist churches. Amen. Listen, you know what the Bible says? The Bible says the dead in Christ shall rise first. Honey, that's Baptist going to be there a hundred years before anybody else arrives. Because we got a head start. We've been so dead so long. Mm. Well, you know, I'm telling the truth now. Shout it out. But you know, not only were they dead, but it said they were dry. Amen. Most Baptist churches dry and cracker juice. And if you can get any dry and cracker juice, you let me know what it is. And brother, I'm telling you, this dry religion is enough to make God sick in his stomach. Amen. We need the tears of compassion and some weeping in our churches. But he said they were dead and they were dry. And then the third thing, they were divided. Amen. Now, brothers, that's not the average Baptist church. Dead, dry, and divided. I don't know what it is. But he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? He said, preach. Hallelujah. And so he got up there and he preached his message. And you know what happened as he preached? He said those old bones begin to move. And he heard a rocket and a noise. Amen. You know what? most people say, uh, they think they've had a revival when Uncle Bill hollers amen, uh, and Aunt Matilda gets her hanky out uh, and runs it around one time, uh, or somebody will jump up someplace and say, glory, and they say, oh, it's home, we're in the midst of revival. Now listen, I like that noise, and I like that shouting, but that don't mean you had revival, amen? He said, Lord, I've got them on the move. He said, what do you suggest I do? He said, preach on, honey, you ain't got the job done yet, amen? And you know what it is? He delivered a second message, and he said, he preached that second time, and he said, the sinews came on those bones. And of course, that's the sinews of the nervous system, and the, the signs of life, and those old bones that had been dead and dry. Had now begun to steer and move and gave the appearance of the newness of life. And that's a type or a picture of the new birth. Amen. Listen, I hope some people get saved this week. I hope every single night this week somebody will walk this aisle and make peace with God through Jesus Christ. I'm looking to see people saved. But you listen to me. 
I'll trade that for revival. I'll trade that for revival. Listen, most people think today that you have revival by sending a letter to John R. Wright and tell him how many people raised their hand and three people sneezed. Now, that's, uh, that's what some people think revival is in this day. But that is not revival. Brother, I'll tell you what. You can have a soul-winning campaign and not have revival. You can have an evangelistic campaign and not have revival. But if we'll ever one time have revival, revival, then souls will be saved down through the ages. And America needs an old-fashioned, holy ghost, sky blue, tin revival to fall across our land. We haven't had one in 50 years, and I believe we're due. I hope it starts this week, right here in this city, in this community, among this people. Amen. But he said, Lord, he said, they're moving now. They've got the signs of life. He said, what do you want me to do? He said, preach on. Amen. And he preached the third time, and that group that was dead and dry and divided, uh, and they'd come and they'd begin to stare to the sinews of the sign of life. And then it said they joined together and they appeared as a mighty army ready to march to victory. Brother, yeah. that's the kind of revival we need. Amen. Uh, that these that are dead and dried and divided uh, will come together and have the joy and have the tears of compassion. Join together, determined to fight the battle till the victory's won. Uh, to the glory of God. You say, preacher, hard place? Yes. He had a hard place at Carmel. He had a hard place at Nineveh. He had a hard place in the Valley of Dry Bones. But I'm glad that there's no place too hard for God to send revival. Amen? You say, preacher, nothing too hard for God? Listen, I want you to know, secondly, there's no problem too hard for God to solve. Amen? Now, you listen to me and listen very carefully. You say we don't have any problems. Well, you're not doing anything for God. Let me tell you this. Anybody that does anything for God is going to encounter some problems. Do you think that the devil is going to let somebody have a mission program? You think the devil's going to let people stand for this old book? You think the devil's going to let people tell you or preach where they get people to take a separated stand and not do something to cause a problem and cause a hindrance? You might as well know that if you ever stand for God, you're going to be in a battle. Uh, listen, uh, you don't see these old dead, dried up, uh, twice dead churches split and all that. Uh, it takes some life to people get in a fight. Amen? Uh, they don't have enough life to even uh, uh, cause a good trap around there. Uh, but you know who the devil gets into? He gets into the independent, the fundamental, the Bible-believing Baptist church. It'll get people scared up and cause divisions because that's the only way he can defeat the work of God. And let me tell you something, honey. You start doing something for God, you can look for the problems. I preached down in Florida not too long ago. And I, I, I don't know what I was preaching, but I said something about some problems. Uh, and, and a few people laughed. Uh, and then a little bit later on, I said again something about some problems. And, and they laughed again. And after it was over, the pastor come up to me and he said, Preacher, you made a boo-boo. And I said, Well, I'm uh, not surprised. I've made a, a lot of them. What did I do wrong this time? And he said, No. He said, uh, he said I've taught my people uh, that we don't have problems. Uh, he said, A Christian does not have problems. Uh, he said, we, we just don't have problems. And I geared him to this. We don't have problems. We have opportunities. And I told him, I said, bless God, I don't care if you call them black sheep. They're still problems. Amen? Now, you may disguise it. You may do something with it. But I want you to know if you ever serve God, any people that have ever served God have run into problems. And the devil seemed to it. But what I want you to know is when the problems come, that God's able to solve every problem. Amen? Now, there's no problem to hard for God to solve. Uh, listen, uh, you stop and <laughs> think just a minute. Do you remember how the children of Israel came up to the River Jordan? Do you remember how they were supposed to go across to the other side? And do you know that because of unbelief, uh, they turned back and they wandered in the wilderness uh, for 40 years. Uh, do you know why that was? Uh, because they were afraid of the problem. Uh, they got up there and they said, yes, sir, that land's everything that God said it was. <coughs> Truly, it's a land that flows with milk and honey. Uh, can you imagine it took two uh, first-class soldiers uh, to carry back one little old, uh, uh, thing of grace uh, on their shoulder? And it said everything that God said. Surely, it's the land of milk and honey. And that's all that God promised. Uh, 
They said, you know, uh, they giants over there. Uh, and we're just grasshoppers in their sight. Uh, and you know what? Uh, ten of those spies voted and said, let's turn back. Uh, but old Caleb and Joshua, they said, let us go up at once. Uh, for we're well able <laughs> to take it. Amen. Uh, but you know what happened? Those un- <coughs> unbelief prevailed. And they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. <coughs> I want you to go back now. 45 years later. And I want you to see a strange scene. They've crossed over Jordan, and it stood up and stood at attention as they walked by. They'd gone over, and they walked around the walls of Jericho and shouted the victory, and they'd fallen in. And out there one day you'll see two fellas, one of them's Joshua and one of them's Caleb, and they're having a little conversation that sounds kind of strange. No Caleb's doing the talking, and he says, Hey, Josh. And Joshua said, Yeah, what is it, Kate? And he said, Have you noticed me? Have you looked at me lately? And he said, Well, I've been wandering around with you all these years. Yes, sir, I, I've got a pretty good look at you. He said, Yeah, but have you noticed? Uh, look at this. And uh, he showed him how springy his feet his legs were. He said, Do you know something? Uh, he said, I'm in pretty good shape for a fella 80 some years old. Look at that. I haven't lost a spring in my steps. Uh, and he said, That's right. Uh, he said, Do you know something? And my eyesight's not dimmed a bit. He said, I can see as good as I could when we crossed the river 45 years ago. He said, it's not failed a bit. Joshua said, that's right. He said, how about that? Look at that. Have you felt my muscle lately? About that time old Joshua got the message, amen? He said, what in the world are you trying to tell me? He said, well, he said, do you see that mountain over there? He said, I believe that's the mountain the Lord promised me. And I want that mountain. He said, I want you to give it to me. He was an old fella, 85 years old. But you know what I believe? I believe for 40 years they'd walked in that wilderness. And somehow or another, I believe that all the time they were walking in the wilderness, I believe old Cain was back on the end and was kind of walking back there and saying, what are we doing out here? I believe 45 years he'd been falling for a fight. And he believed that he could have whipped those giants up and now he wanted out of me, man. He said, I want that mountain. That's the one the Lord promised me. Give me that mountain. You know what, old Josh said, stick them, bulldog. Go get them. Hallelujah. You know what? I'm here to report something to you. You know how many giants old Caleb killed? Not a one. Do you know how many he attacked with a sword? Not one. Do you know how many bones and arrows he shot at giants? Not one. He said, preacher, why? Because when he got ready and he started up there, you know what the Lord did? He fulfilled the promise he made back in the book of Deuteronomy. He said, when you obey my commandments, when you do all that I command you, he said, then I'll send the hornets before you and drive the enemy out of the land. And about the time he started walking up the mountain, God sent a pack of hornets if you put them in a giant thing in business uh, and run them plumb out of the country. Hallelujah. God solved the problem, amen. God solved the problem at the Red Sea when he opened it up and they walked across on dry land and the Egyptians coming after them all drowned in the same river that delivered the Hebrew children, amen. Now, listen, over in Daniel chapter 3, you'll find the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I kind of like those, don't you? They're the three Hebrew children. And you know what happened over there. That to come the time and the place that old Nebuchadnezzar raised up that out of nine and some foot and he said every time that the music starts, uh, everybody bow down and worship the idol. Uh, and he gave the command and it said that everybody, the lords and the mayors and the concubines and the generals and everybody that was somebody, all bowed down. Uh, but they wasn't really worshiping. <laughs> you know why? Some of them was a peek and see what everybody else is doing. Uh, and when it was all over with, uh, you know three fellas didn't bow. Uh, they were little old Hebrew children. Uh, prisoners of war over there. <laughs> Amen. Uh, in a strange land captured by the enemy, but they didn't bow. And they took him up before the king. And you know what the king said? He said, now listen, boys. He said, I probably, you know, give him some kind of a speech about, I, I understand you boys are young, and uh, you didn't understand. They said, now listen, king, don't beat around the bush. I don't try to smooth it over. We're not going to be careful how we answer you. We know what the law said. We know what you wanted. But we determined that we're not going to bow. We worship only Jehovah, the true and the living God. And we won't bow and we won't bend. And God looked over the ramp of the heaven and said, Amen, honey, you ain't going to fall over. Yes, sir. You know what they did? They heated that old furnace seven times hotter than it had ever been heated. And they threw them in. 
Well, glory. And the soldiers that threw them in, you know what happened to them, don't you? They got burnt up. And you know what happened to those three Hebrew children? The only thing that cost them in the fire was the hose and the cords that bound them. The things that would have bound them and restricted them were burnt out to where they walked with the Lord in the midst of the fire. Amen. Listen. Only one thing I regret about them Hebrew children, they weren't Baptists. You say, preacher, they weren't. No, sir, how do you know they weren't? I know because what the Bible said. It said when they come out, they didn't smell like smoke. <laughs> Amen. That's pretty good, huh? And most of them, you know, you find most Baptist churches, they send up a smoke signal between Sunday school and church uh, out on the parking lot, huh? Amen. Listen, uh, anybody who preaches three points ought to have a point. Uh, amen. Uh, so let me give you the only poem I know. Uh, tobacco is a filthy weed. Uh, some say the devil sowed the seed. Uh, robs your pockets, change your clothes. Uh, make your chimney out of your nose. Uh, amen. Uh, listen, uh, glory to God. Uh, I'm trying to preach about there's nothing too hard for God. Amen. Uh, and I want you to know that there's no problem too hard for God to solve. Amen? Then thirdly, I want you to know this. There's no promise too hard for God to keep. Amen? I'm glad. Listen, the Bible says that not one word of all his great promises ever fail. Now, he didn't say not one promise. He said not word. Not one word. He's kept every promise to the letter. Everything that God's ever said, honey, he's been able to deliver the goods. Amen? I'm glad that there's no promise that God ever made. He's never had to back up. He's never said the situation was thus or the certain. No, it didn't make any difference. God said it, and that settles it. You know, I hear a lot of people say, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. That ain't right. God said it, and that settles it. I don't care who believes it. Amen. It's just God. That's all. I've heard so many people say God and one's the majority. God's the majority, no matter if anybody's on his side or not. Amen. He's always in the majority. But listen, I'm glad that there's never been a promise that God couldn't keep. I was preaching up two years ago, I believe it was. It might have been three. In the land of the sky, you believe in Asheville, North Carolina. And they have a great big old preacher's meeting up there every year, the last week in August. And, and they preach all night on the Sunday night. They have the Inspirations Quartet and Brother Mays Jackson. And I don't know, they claim they had 6,000 people there on the grounds and in the building. And they had preachers from all over the country and all that. And in the midst of all that, uh, old Brother Mays come up and he put his arm around me. Uh, and he said, Home, he said, I want you to preach the last message tonight. Uh, he said, I want you to ring this thing out with a shout. Uh, he said, I want, if, if you've ever preached, I want you to preach. Uh, and I said, well, Brother Mays, I'll try. And I said, you pray for me. And I went on down and I sat on the front row uh, right there. And I summoned through my Bible and I was wondering, what in the world are you going to preach to 600, maybe uh, 700 preachers? And they've heard everything and some of the best men in America and all. And I was trying to get my message together and trying to get my thoughts. And at about that time, I felt a little uh, tug on my arm. And I looked and there was a fella. And I mean, he was as country as I was. Uh, now, I'm not saying this to criticize him. Don't you ever misunderstand me. I'm not trying to do that. I'm just trying to describe this fella. Either his legs were too long or his britches were too short or something. Because they, they didn't cover each other right, you know. And he had on them fruits and shoes and them white socks. He's a regular one of them mountaineers or Georgia crackers or whatever you want to call him, one of them rednecks. Uh, just like I am. Amen? Uh, but listen, he was standing down there and he pulled on that plea uh, and he said, play for me. Uh, and I said, I'll be glad to. Uh, he said, I mean now. Uh, he said, I'm going to preach the first message tonight. Uh, I said, bless God, uh, you pray for me. If you leave anything, I'm going to preach the second message. Hallelujah. Amen? Uh, but listen, if I'd have known who that fellow was, uh, I'd have jumped up and shouted just to be sitting on the pew because I didn't know then. But his name was Buck Henley. And old Buck Henley lives over in Hendersonville, North Carolina. And you know what he did? He wrote that little old song, Climb, Climb, Sunshine Mountain. Now, some of y'all sung that in uh, Bible school and, and children's church and all. And the only word in there that's religious or Christian is just the name Jesus is in there. But this is what they did. The Budweiser Beer Company come down and wanted to buy that little song from old Buck Henley. And they offered him $30,000 for that song. And he said, no, it's not for sale. He said, I wrote it for the Lord. And he said, I'm not going to sell it. And when they determined that he wouldn't sell it, this is what they said. 
They said, we don't really want the song. And you can go ahead and you can put it in all the books and all that you want to. All we're going to do is just change it, <coughs> a couple of the words around. And we want the tune to make it for a jingle. And so what they did was that he could have still kept the rights to the song and the words as it was written. And they gave him the $30,000 to use the jingle. And he said, no. He said, all them little kids heard that in Bible school, Sunday school. He said, they'd hear that on that television or that radio and they'd run in there. He said, no, sir. He said, I wrote that to the glory of God. And he said, you, you just don't have my price. There's no more need to talk about it. He said, as long as I live, you'll never use my song. Well, if I'd known that, I'd have shouted just sitting beside a fellow that stood. Amen. But anyway, I didn't know who he was. But he said, I'm going to preach the first message. And he said, pray for me. And so I did. And that night he got up and he began to preach. And he preached a little old simple message on grace. And I know that everybody's heard it. He had saving grace and schooling grace and sufficient grace and supplying grace. And uh, everybody's preached that outline. I preached it a million times myself. But I never preached it like he did. Amen. I mean, the glory of God got on. And he was preaching that message. In, in Trinity Baptist Church where they hold that thing. It's a huge auditorium. They got a choir as big as this auditorium, and that thing's panoramic. It goes from one end of the building around in a kind of a semicircle to the other, and across the front of that, they got one of those great big mahogany choir reel things like, and you know what that little fella did? He got excited, and he started riding the good horse of grace all the way to glory, and he jumped right up there, and he got on that old choir reel. I tried to help him, hallelujah. Boy, it sounded like a good idea to me, amen. But listen, he preached on grace, and he got down to that place where God gives you the grace in the hour of death. And boy, he was talking about that grace that was sufficient to cross over Chile, Jordan. And he told this story. He said that when he was over there in Hendersonville one night, and his phone rang, and there was some people up on the mountain, and all he said was, Brother Buck, they said, Granny's dying. She's a sinking fast. And old Buck said, I'll be right there. And he got in his little old car, and he went up that mountain. And when he got up there in front of that little old mountain cabin, and he walked in, and they said she's in the back room. And old Buck went in there, and in that back room, that little old woman, now he wasted away to almost just skin and bones. And he reached over in that bed, and he took Granny by the arm. And he said, Granny, he said, they tell me you're a sinking fast. And she looked up at him, she said, Buck, shame on you. How in the world can you be sinking when you're mired up in the rock of ages? <laughs> Ooh, uh, mm -mm. 
But anyway, old Buck said, Granny, she said, I heard them. She said, I was listening when they called you. She said, sure enough, Buck. She said, I'm getting ready to make my long journey. She said, when the sun rises in the morning, she said, I'll be on the other side of looking back at it. She said, I'm going home to be with the Lord. She said, she's trying to die, but it's too busy to die because there's a shouting carrying on in that back room. Amen. But he said, Granny said, I'm here. And he said, now listen, now said, I, I'm going to have a word of prayer with you. He said, that's good, Buck. He said, before I do, I, I'm going to read you something out of the Bible. And he picked up Granny's old Bible over there. He said, what's your favorite passage? What would you like for me to read? And he began to thumb through. And you know what he saw? He saw a great big capital T, capital P on the top of that page. And then he turned over another page, and there it was again, right in the middle. Turned another page, and he's on there two or three times. And he said, Granny, Granny. He said, what's all this TP, TP, TP? He said, almost every page I see a TP. He said, what's that? And she looked at him and she said, Buck, she said, if you look real close, you'll find every time it says TP, it's about one of the promises of God. And said, that TP means tried and proven. Hallelujah. Listen, let me tell you something. Just go ahead and put TP right across the whole book. Amen. I'm glad that every promise in the book is true. Brother, I'm glad every promise in the book's mine. Amen. I'm glory to God. I believe we ought to carry a 15-minute recess, uh, go down the middle of whatever this town is, and shout glory to God, uh, and wake up this place. Uh, glory. I'm glad the promises of God are true. Amen. Oh, my soul. Listen. Did you read what it said here? It said, listen now. Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return him to thee according to the time of life. And Sarah... So have a son. You know what the Bible says? You know what the promise of God was? Said, now, I'm going to give you a son. Said, old Abraham's 100 years old. Sarah's 90 years old. Now, you don't have to believe what I believe. And I'm not trying to read something, and I'm not trying to add to that this is what it said. He said, at the appointed time, I'm going to give him the time of life. And you know what I believe? I believe they conceived that child, one at 100 and one at 90. I believe that for nine months, old Sarah carried that baby at the age of 90 years old. I want you to see something tonight. Maybe you won't see it just like I do. But I believe it might have happened this way. You know what? I can see a little old woman, 90 years old plus. Can you imagine that little old wrinkled lady? Can you just see her? And you know what she's doing? She's just sitting out there one day. And you know what? She's just sitting there. And she's having the best time. You know what she's doing? She got her some knitting needles and a roll of yarn, and she's a knitting booty Hallelujah. <laughs> and you know what she's doing? And you know about the time I can just see her sitting there, and I can see one of them old Arabs come riding across the desert on a camel. Can you see this? And here he comes, you know.
Now, ladies, I believe the day of signs and miracles is over, so don't you go home tonight and pray to get back 35. Uh, if your husband dies of a heart attack anyway, hallelujah. So, uh, but I believe, uh, amen, uh, there's no promise too hard for God to keep. Amen. Let me give you a couple more right quick. There's no prayer too hard for God to answer. Amen. You say, amen. No prayer too hard for God to answer. Listen. This is a true story. Probably, I don't know whether they carried it in Cincinnati or not, but the picture came out in the Atlanta Journal. And not only there, it was picked up by the Associated Press and went in papers all across the South. I, I know I saw it in more places than one. But this is the picture that was carried. There was a man by the name of Aldo Pozzi. And Aldo Pozzi lives and still lives in New Ritchie, Florida. And old Aldo Parza had gone to the airport at Tampa, Florida to meet his wife and his children. His wife and children were to leave Chicago that morning on flight 928. And 928 was to leave O'Hara Field and land at 1040 in Tampa. Non-stop flight from Chicago to Tampa. And old Aldo had gone there to meet the plane. Now this is what happened. It's recorded. It's history. Flight 928 took off from O'Hare Field. Three minutes in flight, it exploded and burst into flames. That ever passenger on board, the pilot, the co-pilot, and the crew, there were 43 people on board. The bodies were scattered all over the countryside at 20-some miles. And this is, you can go back and verify this. What they did... And involved a big lawsuit and all, but they did this. They buried them in one common grave. They have a monument there in Weehawken, Illinois, where they picked up those bodies, some missing arms, some just joints and uh, feet and so on and so forth. And they put all those in a grave and erected a monument there. And at that time, it was the greatest air tragedy over the United States. Now, I think since then, out in Los Angeles, they've had one that was worse. But they erected that monument and that common tomb. Now, down in Tampa, Florida, nobody knew what had happened. And they were waiting on that plane, 928, to land at Tampa. And the airline officials came through, and they announced something like this and said, All those people that are waiting for passengers or the arrival of Flight 928 to please assemble at a certain place or section of the airport. And that, of course, sounded strange, but people began to miss. And when they got there, they saw that an ambulance was backed up to the door. They saw that they had a nurse there with her uniform. They had a little old doctor there with a bag. They had a preacher that was a chaplain at some hospital or something that was there. And people knew there was something wrong. Without anybody saying a word, some of them began to weep and cry and began to say, What's the matter? What's happened? What's wrong? And they asked them, they said, Please, would everybody be seated? And by the time they got them into seats, people were just crying. They knew that sixth sense had told them there was something wrong. And the airline official stood there and he said, there's no easy way to tell you this. And he said, flight 928 took off from O'Hare Field this morning. Three minutes in flight, it exploded and burst into flames. It said all 38 passengers and five crew members were killed. There are no survivors. Some people fainted, some screamed, some wept. The doctors and the nurses attended some. Here's the picture. Old Aldo Park got down on his knees, put his hands and his fingers, and when they took that picture, it looked like they were embedded in that marble top of that ticket counter. And he began to weep and cry and pray to God. And he said, oh, Lord, I will not accept this. This cannot happen. And boy, he began to talk to God. And he said, you can't take my thing. And he began to tell him about the things that they'd planned and the, the, the plans that they'd made and how they were going to serve the Lord and the things that they wanted to do and how one of those boys had been dedicated to the Lord to preach the gospel. And, and he, he just wept and cried and begged God and said, God, you've got to do something for me. I, I can't accept this. Here's the picture they took. He'd been on his knees there in front of that ticket counter 45 minutes. His face, the tears had streamed down and had scalded his face. 
it had been wrinkled and he was in contrition and agony and those hands looked like they were in that metal. An old photographer came by and snapped that picture and they put it in the paper and they had a one word caption under it. Agony. 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 You say, preacher, what are you trying to tell me? Isn't it pitiful that God has to send a tragedy before we learn to agonize in prayer? Isn't that pitiful? Isn't it? Oh, it's before it happened. It's before it fell. If we'd agonized before God, what could we have? They took that picture and they put it in the paper. Agony. I wish it had been there ten minutes later. I wish they had taken a second picture. Ten minutes later, another airline official came through. He said, we're looking for Aldo Parker. He wasn't among those people. And finally somebody said, that may be him. The old airline official went over there where he was still on his knees and still talking to God. And he shook him and he said, are you Mr. Parker? And he didn't answer him. He finally got his attention. He said, are you Aldo Parker? And he kind of wiped away the tears and looked at him and said, yes, sir, that's me. He said, we have a message for you. And here's what it was in the telegram, and I don't know the exact words, but it was words to this effect. He said, Aldo, he said, on the way to the airport this morning, we had a flat tire, and we missed the flight, 928. He said, we'll arrive at 1220 today and gave the flight. Wait for us at the airport. You say, preacher, that's coincidence. No, sir, that is not coincidence. You say, what is it? It's Isaiah chapter 65, verse 24. And Isaiah chapter 65, verse 24 says this. It says, it shall come to pass that before they call on me, I will hear and answer their prayer. Listen, brother. If God can answer a prayer before it's ever prayed. If God can see and God does and God holds up his if he can give answers to prayer before we've ever prayed, what would he do if we had learned to agonize in prayer? Listen, I don't even remember where it was, but I was preaching one night, and I was preaching from over in Luke around the story of old blind Bartimaeus. And I was preaching about old Bartimaeus and as he prayed one day to the Lord. And I don't know what all I preached, but I remember this one of the things that really stuck out in my mind. It said that old Bartimaeus cried, and it said that Jesus stood still. Can you imagine that the cry of an old blind man out there stopped the King of Kings and the Lord of Glory, and he stood still, immovable to hear what that old beggar wanted and cried and pled for. And you know what he did? He turned to that crowd and he said, bring him to me. And when they brought him there, he said to him, What wilt thou have me do for thee? Literally, he said, What do you want from God? What do you want from me? And old Bartimaeus said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. Well, I tell you, that thrills me, amen. But I preached one night on what do you want from God? What do you want from God? And I don't remember what all I preached. But one of the things I did, I used old Rebecca as a type of the church. Where Rebecca had cried out and she said, Lord, give me children or I die. And I talked about that the church would die that did not give birth. And I remember that was part of it. And good type there. And I remember another thing that I did. I talked about old Solomon. Where he went out before God and God asked him or offered him anything in the world. And he said, what I want is the wisdom to lead my people according to the will of God. Boy, that was a prayer, wasn't it? I preached about old Elijah and Elias, and how Elias prayed for a double portion of the Spirit of God, and how he performed the 14 miracles in the double portion. I don't remember what all I preached, but I, I had some different things that I used. And that night I asked people, I said, what would you come for? What would you dare to come and get on your face before the God and plead? And, and, and What do you want from God? Boy, people began to come and began to fill up that altar. The old preacher come down and said he wanted the anointing of the Holy Ghost on his life. The boy wanted that power to be another Elisha. And he began to do that. And then one of the deacons came down. 
He said that he'd been an officer in that church for so many years, and the church hadn't done as it could. And he wanted the wisdom that, uh, to be a good deacon. And boy, he began to cry around there. And teachers began to cry and wanted uh, souls saved. And men and women began to want mom and daddy saved and brothers and sisters. And, and the next thing I knew, there must have been a hundred people all across the front of that church and all of them weeping and crying. And, and boy, they wanted things from God. And about in the midst of that, a little old boy, must have been about eight years old or nine years old, got up from the back and started down. Boy, I began to get a rumbling in my soul. I said, surely that boy wants to be the next Billy Sunday. I, that boy wants to be D.L. Moody. I, I just knew God was doing something for that boy. And you know what I did? I stepped out and I said, son, what do you want from God? And you know what he did? He looked at me right eyeball to eyeball. He said, I want a chocolate candy bar. You know what I did? I reached down my pocket. I got him a quarter. I said, you buy whatever candy bar you want, amen. You know what he did? He sold out two feet. He'd asked for a box of Whitman samplers. I'd have bought that for him, amen. Huh? Amen. I would have. But that boy sold out two feet. You know what I believe? I believe we sell out two feet in the matter of prayer. What do we want from God? What are we willing to agonize with God for? What do we put the limit on? There's no prayer too hard for God to answer. What could we have here this week? What could we have if we dare to believe God? What do you want from God? Then the fifth thing I want you to know tonight, and I'll close with this. No person too hard for God to say. Well, I don't know about anybody else. I'm glad I believe this old book. I'm glad I believe every job, every city. I believe every chapter, every division, every point. Amen. Put it down there. I'm one of them fanatics. Amen. Yeah, I believe whosoever will can come. I'm glad I haven't gotten my brains knocked out and got into that hyper Calvinism no more than God does. Amen. I'm glad I just believe what the book says. Whosoever will, let him come. Amen. You say, it won't work. Well, let me show you something. Maybe one night this week I'll get to do it. I was brought up in a drunkard's home. My daddy was a saloon keeper in the gang. My grandfather was a saloon keeper in the gang. If you go to Tampa, Florida tonight, the Evans Distillery is the largest distillery in the state of Florida. That's an uncle and an aunt of mine. They're in the liquor business. They say I'm the black sheep in the family. Bless God, the only sheep I am is one of God's sheep. Amen. And I like it that way. But I was brought up in that atmosphere. I never owned a Bible until I was 27 years old. I didn't know John 3.16 until I was 28. Never had memorized. Now, I'm sure I must have been around church. I can remember turning the radio off when preachers came on. I, I, I'd seen some people, but I did not know John 3.16 when I was 27 years old. But the fellow invited me one night to a church service, and a man preached. And the Holy Ghost came down. And for three days, and I was under Holy Ghost conviction. I mean... I knew I was going to die in my sins and go to hell. I was under such a burden. And I was in the Navy. Didn't know anybody. Didn't know anybody to talk to. Didn't, I didn't know what to do. But at 2.15, 2.30 in the morning, January the 2nd, 1950, building 109, dorm 64, bunk number 4, about 6 inches in from the right-hand side. I got down on my knees in the midst of that old barracks over there. And I misquoted John 6, 37. I know what it says tonight. John 6, 37 says, All that the Father gives me shall come unto me. And him that cometh to me, I will know why I cast out. I didn't know it that night. I missed it a thousand miles. But I got out of that bed that night, and I began to confess, and I began to talk to the Lord. And I told him I was a drunkard. And see, 
and a lion, and an adultery, card shot, gambling. And I told him I was sorry for my sins. And I told him I was sorry. That's all I knew how to do. Yeah. I just started confessing. And I come down to a point, and this is what I did. I said, now, Lord, somebody told me. Now, I didn't know who it was. But somebody told me, it says this in the Bible. And I misquoted John 6, 7, 7. This is what I said. It's pitiful. I know it is. But I said, Lord, somebody told me, if I'd come, you'd do something for me. Not to know anything. I just said, Lord, somebody told me that I can. You'd do something for me. And I said, Lord, here I am. And I don't want to die in my sin. I don't want to go to hell. And won't you do something for me? <laughs> you know what he did? <laughs> Save my soul. <laughs> you know why I did? Because this old book says that he sweat. To so call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. And you say, preacher, why do you say? Because you're not saved by knowledge. You're saved by grace. Right. It's not what you know. It's who you believe. And I just come down there and that man. Just knew that I was a sinner. Knew that I was bound to the pit of hell. But was determined to get in touch with the Lord. Because I believed he could and would do something for me. Now that's salvation by grace through faith. Plus nothing, minus nothing. And that's the only way you'll get saved or anybody else. God doesn't have but one plan and but one way of salvation. For by grace are you saved through faith. Now that's what I want to ask you tonight. Would you trust him to save you? He said, whosoever. You say, preacher, you don't know my time. I'm not concerned with your sin. God knows. But I tell you, if I didn't have anything else to preach, and I didn't know anything else in all this world, I'd stand from here to eternity and cry to everybody that went by. Christ receive it. Sinful me. Glory to God, that's enough to get that job done. And he said, if you'll come, if you'll call, you'll do the cleaning. Salvation is of the Lord. But you have to desire it. You have to want it. You have to will but if you'll come and you'll ask the promise of God is that he'll refuse none do you trust him tonight he can save you the only thing that can keep you from being saved tonight is you it's not the will of the father that any should perish but that all come to repent would you do that tonight? Would you slip right out and come and say, sink, swim, live, or die? I'm going to trust him. Him to know it's like he's done. Every head bowed, every eye closed. While heads are bowed and while eyes are closed. I want to ask you something now tonight. How many people in this building can say, preacher, no ifs, no ands, no buts, no doubts? I know I'm saved. Would you slip that hand up? Would you do it? All right, thank you. I believe just about every hand that went up. I might have missed somebody. And I don't ever want to preach and not give people an opportunity to get right with God. While every head's bowed and every eye's closed and nobody's looking around. Is there one person here to say, Preacher, I'm not sure, I'm not certain, I don't know that I'm saved. But I'm concerned enough about my never-dying soul 
but I want to be remembered in this closing word of prayer. Pray for me. I'm not going to leave this pulpit. I'm not going to come down and stand in front of you. I'm not going to drag you down the aisle. But I'd count it the greatest privilege in the world if you let me pray for you. I don't want you to die in your head. God doesn't want you to die in your head. This preacher and the people of this church don't want you to die in your head. And if you do, you'll go over the shed blood of Jesus Christ tonight. I want to pray for you. I'm concerned. Are you concerned enough to slip up that hand and say, Preacher, I want to be remembered in that closing word of prayer. I don't want to die and go to hell. Thank you, dear Lord. Thank you. Is there another? Slip that hand up. All I ask you to give me and the people of this fine church the privilege to pray for you. Is there another? Flip it up. Right now, while we wait just a moment, preacher, I don't want to die and go to hell. I'm concerned enough about my never dying soul. Remember me and pray for me. Anybody else, just flip it up. Right quick. Right. All right. How about you, Christian? How many Christians are there here tonight? You know you're saved, but you have to be honest. You'll say, Preacher, even though I am a Christian, I've not been a good soldier of the cross. I've not been a good witness. My life has not borne fruit. You'd be honest enough to say that tonight and say, Preacher, I want to be remembered in that word of prayer. I want to be the Christian I ought to be. Pray for me. Would you slip that hand out? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Dear Lord, hands are going up all over the building tonight. Now, it's not important that I see hands. You've looked at every heart. You've walked up every aisle and through every pew. Even better than that, you've gone inside the heart and looked behind the secret chambers and the locked doors. And you know our hearts better than we do. You know the need of every man and every woman and every boy and girl in this church tonight. Now, Lord, I pray for that one that said, I'm not sure, I'm not certain. I don't know that I'm saved. And I pray on the first verse that through the leadership of the Holy Spirit that you'd draw that one to you. I pray that you'd give her the courage to slip out of that aisle and come down and let Brother Wayne or myself, some of the ladies that said, come by, take this whole book and show us. She can know that she leaves this building tonight saved for time and for eternity. And that the count settled and the names written down in glory. I pray, Lord, that you'll do that for us tonight. Then, Lord, a score, 25, 30 people in this building tonight raised their hand. Said, I want to be the Christian that I should. I want to live. A life that will bear fruit for you. I pray, Lord, tonight that you'd touch and strengthen Christians. I pray that men and women would come tonight and agonize with you in prayer. Maybe for mama. Maybe for daddy. Maybe for sons and daughters and brothers and sisters. Or habits, faults, and failures in their life. I don't know what's needed. But the only invitation I'm going to give tonight to mind the Holy Spirit. Oh, God, reveal to them what they need. And give them the courage to seek you and your will for their life tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand. We're going to sing. Whatever the song leader has, whatever, I don't know. I believe God wants to do something here tonight. I believe we can have revival if we'll simply mind the Holy Spirit. You're not saved tonight, you come. You're a Christian. I use this word right. I don't ask people to rededicate their lives. Somehow or another, people have rededicated their lives so we've worn out the carpet. 
I believe there's a need for people to come and dedicate themselves and you and the press to the cause of Christ. You tell God that he's got all of them and they're going to use their lives. You just mind the Holy Spirit tonight. As we can. second verse says, just as I am, and waiting not. That's the only way people get saved. It's just like they are. If you try to straighten up, straighten up, the devil says that you will not do that. Man saved simply by coming to Christ. In every place in the Bible that you read about that, the time to do it is now. It says, behold, now it's the death. Now is the day of salvation. John 16, 31, Jesus asked the question, Do you now believe? It's just like you are, and it's right now. Won't you do it? Won't you come? Some have come, others need to come. When I have to sing the second verse, I'm going to step out of the way and pray. I'm going to ask Brother Wayne to come, and he'll do what he wants to. This invitation is not between me and you between you and the Holy Spirit of God. Will you mind it? It will sing another verse.
pray, would you come, let us take the Bible and show you how to be a Christian. Not to invite you to a church, but to invite you to Christ. We thrilled to take the Bible and show you the plan of salvation, how Jesus died for you, how you can be saved and go out of this building. Would you come? glad that I'm still in business where I can hear him and you know to where God can take and even ask some men of God that can stand and boy his spirit bear witness with yours that boy what's going on is from God and you better get all you can get and get all you've got so good that he still just talks to us thankful not only for the book but for the preaching of the word it's always for our good sometimes it don't feel good but it, it's good in now it's good appreciate brother Smith how many of you, honestly, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. Just say it in your heart. You know, with a decision, you feel like you made in your heart tonight. You honestly want the Lord to do something for us this week. We've got things that we want God to do here in our church. We want things we want God to do for our church, our people, as far as relatives and those in the area. We want God to do something for the area. But you honestly, with all your heart, your life and your heart is open to the disposal of God. What God wants for you tonight, you'll, you'll do it. What if God calls you at 2 o'clock and says, you get out and get on your knees fast? Are you going to say, God, I've got to go to work in the morning. I get up at 5 o'clock. You're going to obey the Lord. I mean, something uh, something that God wants you to do. You obey the Lord this week, and I promise you we'll see some things whereby things that God can rejoice and God get all the glory for. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm glad you're here. And welcome to this congregation. Come and help us tomorrow night. And uh, Lord bless us for the good crowd tomorrow night, some more visitors. We appreciate the visitors we had here tonight. And uh, concerning Brother Smith, I'm thankful that he's a faithful minister to God. So thankful God can use him. Thankful God is using him. God can use him this week to speak to our hearts. Our